Okay, thank you, Ayush. Um, right, uh, today I'm going to talk about another round of breaking and making for the money, how to how not to do it from that and, and more. And this is John work with Carl Montgomery and Mark Yanni. And our paper is published in Eurocrypt this year and also in the workshop of QIP. But unfortunately, none of me or my co authors could go to these conferences, but we had proxy giving our talks. And, uh, and this is the paper is on Ukraine and archive. And I will give some credit for Hart and uh, for sharing these slides for QIP. And I made some modifications uh, and more stuff to do this presentation. Uh, okay. Uh, so firstly, uh, the most famous task performed by quantum computers is perhaps uh, breaking cryptography. So it's uh, so with uh, 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 with like uh, uh, full power quantum computers, uh, it can perform this short algorithm that breaks most of the uh, modern cryptography tools that we use to break public key, uh, like public key cryptography. But, uh, on the other hand, as we go into the quantum a uh, world of quantum information. In fact, we would be able to build something constructive, not that things destructive. Uh, there is uh, cryptography protocols built on quantum information where people send quantum information, uh, use quantum information to achieve things, some of the things uh, more easily than we achieve in classical world or sometimes even achieve things impossible in the classical world. And the, all of these uh, examples here, uh, you may be familiar with some of the names, uh, quantum key distribution, which is kind of famous protocol that people have been already running uh, practical experiments, and quantum money, which I will talk about today. And the third you might be uh, less familiar with, but they, they are all highly relevant with this uh, quantum mechanical principle called the no cloning principle. The no cloning principle is something very specific to, to the quantum information. It says that. Uh, once you are given uh, an arbitrary and unknown quantum states, there is no generic procedure that turns this quantum state into two copies. Uh, this is the information theoretic statement. And uh, the, the procedure itself is simply nonlinear and not allowed. Um, but in our case, you will soon see that we consider this principle and uh, the variance of this principle in, in, the, uh, in the computational settings when you have some auxiliary information about this quantum state. Even. And uh, so we want to take use of this principle uh, that's so special about quantum information to achieve things that are not achievable in the classical world. Uh, like one famous application, I would say actually the first application is about quantum money. And was a pioneering idea put forward by Wiesner uh, around how many years, years this, like 60 years, 50 years ago. And he, he put, put forward this notion of Quantum, uh, quantum money that actually inspired all these latter works on um, quantum cryptography. Uh, in a quantum money scheme, a bank uh, has a quantum computer and it makes um, a, a quantum state that encodes a money value and a serial number and sends it to a user. And when the user wants to spend this money state, they can come to the bank and ask the bank to verify for him. And it shows that to, to for example, to another. Uh, that, uh, for example, Alice wants to buy, buy a product and uh, they, they come to the bank and Alice says, okay, this is my money state. The bank get, a bank guy can verify it for, for you and for me and uh, it shows my money state value. I give it to you and you give me your product. Um, however, uh, suppose this uh, Alice is malicious and she wants to make two copies out of this so that she can double spend. Uh, she's not supposed to do so. Um, so Basically, we want to say that there is no procedure of Alice turning into turning this one copy of valid quantum money issued by the bank into two copies so that they can both pass the verification by the bank and thereby Alice can, can double spend. And uh, uh, from now on, I've introduced uh, the basic notion, and I will uh, this is an outline of today's talk. So I will first talk about why we care about quantum money and its uh, importance in quantum cryptography. 
a brief history of works on quantum money, and then I will talk about the main results of our paper. Uh, the first one is an attack on a proposed money scheme, a recently proposed scheme, and uh, and uh, we, we sort of generalize it to, to rule out a class of quantum money from lattices. And the second uh, is a new approach for, for building quantum money, which we generalize a framework from past works on, uh, from, from a past work on, on quantum money. And we also give a candidate instantiation of this new approach. Um, so, so why does quantum money matter? Uh, I would say it's implicitly one of the central topics in quantum cryptography since its appearance, uh, because uh, it's one of the the, the holy grail people have uh, have been trying to build, and it's uh, it's a classically in, in unachievable goal, as I mentioned, uh, and uh, because of this uh, classical unachievability, uh, it's highly relevant to some other. Things it's a it's a sort of a building block to all these other unclonable cryptography. For example, quantum copy protection and as I mentioned, quantum key distribution, which uh, which actually was like directly inspired by this first paper by Wisner on quantum money, as well as uh, something that sounds fancy, chain list blockchain. Uh, if you have like a strong variant of quantum money, which I will later introduce, you may be able to build because uh, it sort of uh, prevents double spending inherently. Uh, you, you, you'll you be able to build like a, something like a blockchain protocol, but without the chain structure and without some of the, the complicated uh, protocols. And uh, finally, it's, uh, it has this uh, fundamental interest because it's a question about it. This chain is, is more about decentralization of tax. It's like if you have yes. a bank and it has a secret key, then it's not decentralized. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Because uh, the first scheme I, I talk about is like the very first original quantum money scheme, which is not decentralized at all. But I will later talk about something that's more decentralized, and but that's harder to achieve. I went to, that's called public key quantum money. And the more uh, more important is actually uh, something that when the money state is generated, it's not um, uh, it, it doesn't have a, like a classical secret key. You don't have to have that authority to generate it. Uh, so that's something I will introduce later. And yeah. Just now, the original, the very old, uh, primitive quantum money, it's it's centralized, and you rely on that. But ideally, one day we'll be will be able to achieve uh, this final decentralized notion of quantum money that allows us to build uh, a chain of uh, Okay, and okay, just as I mentioned, uh, the one I talked about just now, the uh, the notion is called private key quantum money. And it's the easy side of, of the uh, of building quantum money because uh, yeah we can say it's it's private key. We rely on a bank that holds on to a classical secret, which it uses to verify the money state. So that's bad. Every time Alice and Bob want to do a transaction, they have to come to the bank or say they have to interact with the bank in order to prove that Alice holds on to a valid money state. So we want something. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. Uh, I, I always just put here like a few constructions for private key quantum money. They are already provably secure constructions, and some of them are information theoretically secure. Uh, the first one is by this very first paper by Wisner. It simply is called conjugate coding, where you simply set, uh, sample a random basis and random stream and encode that random, uh, that random stream under this random basis. And the secret key is the basis. Once you know the basis, you can verify the state. But if you don't know it, the, the state is completely random and you, you can't really clone it information theoretically. And uh, there is uh, some other uh, things built from uh, pseudo random states. Uh, I won't go into detail on that. But basically, uh, I would say private key quantum money is easy to achieve. Suppose there is some way that you can turn a, a classical succinct random string, there's an equation procedure to turn into a quantum state, and this quantum state is unclonable, then you probably would be able to. Uh, you you will be able to build a quantum scheme out of it. Oh, question. So when we do the verification, will that lead to, for example, quantum state collapsing? Uh, no. So so yeah, that's a great question. So we don't want that to happen at least not for very large states, right? Because uh -huh. because they uh, Alice would have to use her state for a transaction, so she has to give this state to like the guy who buy uh, who, who sells sells her a product. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the seller would want to keep this money. Right. So if it, it's destructive after verification, then this money is gone. So why, why would the seller sell yeah. anything to her? So so if it's a very money state, 
our verification procedure should ensure that it's at least negatively, like not 100% close, but at least negatively close to the original money state. And it would be able to get past another verification and get past another verification, at least for polynomial in many times. So it's like mm -hmm. when you have an invalid state, then it would collapse. Uh, not not necessarily depends on the scheme, but oh. it, it would probably collapse if you try to do something uh, dishonest. Well, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Generally, as long as you have uh, correctness, which is very close to one, then you can avoid the state collapsing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Suppose you have a valid money state, and this is something called a uh, general measurement uh, principle in quantum mechanics, even though. Uh, you can tell that the verification procedure, it has to output this classical B, 0 or 1, to indicate whether the state is valid. But if it outputs one with very high probability, probably close to one, then you are good. You could just rewind the whole procedure and uh, make sure that the state is undisturbed. That's basically the idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you have some states that's, for, for example, like one half probability being good and one half probability being, being bad, then you would destroy it. Okay, so uh, questions. So for the perfectly primitive, uh, is it does it matter that whether the state collapsed? Because the verifier also has a secret key. So even if the state collapsed, this verifier can just generate a new money. Uh, yeah, yeah, that 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 could yeah that you, you could ask the verifier to to issue you a new money even, mm -hmm. even if something happens. But yeah, that that is conditioned on on the fact that uh there is a secret key uh, held by by the by yes. the verifier. So, um, so I can see that uh, whether the state will collapse uh, is more important in the public key setting. Yes, in yes. this case, you, you don't want the people only who has the PK to break that one. Yes. Right. Uh, as I, I have already mentioned, the drawback, and now we come to the harder test, which is. Uh, the public key case. So uh, the errors, uh, so the uh, the uh, the bank needs also to generate a public key along with the quantum money state. So in some settings, this public key is associated with the money state. In some settings, uh, it's uh, like the public parameters generated before uh, money state is uh, And the and the uh, the challenge for the adversary is that okay, given one copy of the money state, given the public key, which uh, we, uh, we assume the public key to be completely classical information, at least for the scope of our talk. There is like variant of quantum money where this public key is also quantum, but we don't talk about that here. Uh, so the given this information, the adversary tries to generate two copies. Uh, sorry, here uh, the substrate will be uh, daughter son two. Two copies, uh, daughter one, daughter two, and uh, they correspond to the same serial number. So that uh, both of them would have pass verification under, under this public key. Uh, and here is a history of struggles of quantum money, of works on quantum money. Uh, so I think this notion, uh, the public key quantum money notion was uh, put forward in, in this paper by Ellison 2009, and, her, and his proposal was broken in a later work. And uh, some of the other uh, proposals uh, that live up to date right now uh, are these, uh, the ones that I put on the checks, and uh, also this IO, uh, it's one that lives up to date. But um, but the thing is, um, we we have to rely on post quantum IO, which we don't know how to build from relatively standard assumptions. And there's all these checks on these Oracle results. They are probably secure, but in the Oracle model, which is same as saying post quantum black box or ideal application, which is worse <laughs> and, uh, in some sense. And there's all these, okay, you see the, all these crazy assumptions, uh, and some of them are broken, some of them remain just un, unknown because there is a, they are basically like new assumptions people make up in their works, and uh, there is little cryptanalysis. Uh, and for our work, we would, uh, 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 first thing we would, uh, uh, so attack on a regression screen. And we would thank the orders for helping us and uh, communicating throughout the, the procedure. Um, and then we, we would show, uh, we would uh, also show a framework which was uh, inspired by these uh, papers 10 years ago, which uh, is the one called Quantum Money from Not. Uh, 
And, uh, and there are there are still would potentially fit into our framework, as we will see later, but uh, there are still, uh, since the, the conjectures are highly not standard, we do not know much about the actual security if we put in their conjectures, uh, plug in their conjectures in software. Question? So, yeah, I got a question. Yeah, yes. uh, so for those crypto analysis worry is that they break the assumptions they have, or it's just like, the existing proofs has fallen? Uh, I think they just break uh, by, yeah, anything I put across here, it's like the assumption is false. I see. Mm. Which of the constructions still stand today, at least in terms of crypto analysis? Uh, stand today? Well, what, uh, like uh, not known to be broken currently. Okay, so anything that has a uh, a check or a question mark is not known to be broken. And by having a check, I, I said at least uh, they have a direct proof, so they have a correct reduction. Uh, and, uh, and for some of these, the ones that uh, I put on a question mark, it's, uh, I didn't investigate every a single one of them in detail, but some of them um, actually don't really have reductions. So they don't really have security proofs, even from crazy assumptions. And some of them, yeah, it's just we I we, we just don't understand much. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. For, for quantum IO, quantum secure IO, I should put the chat on this one as well. It's the it's most of the Oracle prop, uh, model yeah. or IO, right? I mean, yeah, is, there, yeah, yeah. is there anything without IO that come as an assumption that's not known to be broken? Uh anything not from IO? Uh, I'm not quite sure about these two. There's the paper called uh, modular forms and uh, quaternion algebra. So what they do is they firstly in, uh, proving the oracle model. Then they try to say, okay, I will make some conjectures so to instantiate my oracle. Uh, but I'm not quite sure about like how they how, how strictly these two parts are connected. Whether they have like a direct reduction to their uh, to their conjecture or it's more loosely connected. So I haven't verified that. And for the notes paper, uh, yeah, it's like they actually don't have a reduction at all. They want to have some loose intuition on why the scheme works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And uh, let's go into the first part. Okay. Uh, as I think uh, most of us here are familiar with, uh, this is the short integer solutions, and which is one of the uh, the major building block people have been trying to use to get quantum money from lattice. So as I mentioned, we had all these crazy assumptions or only provably secure uh, constructions from IO or IDO of uh, and that's bad. Well, and why why not use lattices, which is something people, which is something like most well studied and uh, mostly believed to be post quantum. And uh, then there's the the LW assumption, um, and we we would be taking use of this for today's construction uh, and for the attack. So, uh, so this this is the uh, this hash function based the public key quantum money protocol by Gentry. Uh, so why do I talk about it first? Because the the, the paper that we uh, had our attack on was actually uh, sort of a modification from this original protocol, and that's why we believe. This is a large class of protocol that, uh, uh, that's like, uh, that looks very secure at the first glance. And a lot of people were trying to build quantum money, public quantum money out of it, which didn't work. So, so it's quite interesting. And uh, that's why we, we care about it so much. So in the, uh, as I said, there is a public parameter because they, uh, if this is not, uh, suppose this is computed by some trusted authority or probably from like an MPC, that's, it's just the uniform random method A, which we're using the LWE and uh, a CIS assumption. And uh, using this public character, we can generate a money state. Uh, what we do, first thing is uh, we, we prepare this uh, uh, a Gaussian superposition of short vectors. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so, so by Gaussian superposition, I mean this is uh, the the weight of uh, the weight of, of these short vectors are a Gaussian weight. And after that, uh, so this is something you can prepare efficiently without like any uh, just like you can sample this such such a thing classically efficiently. And uh, but in the second step, uh, 
we will apply this public parameter, the metropolitan public parameter, coherently onto this quantum state. And we would measure the, the applied result. So just imagine that you are applying, for example, a superposition, you are applying a function f into a superposition x, and you have a second register where you write down fx. And then you measure this register because these two registers are entangled your, uh, after you get a specific result, for example, u here, your first register would collapse to everything that matches this result. Um, so now you have a quantum state and a classical string u. So this u is the result and you measure, uh, which is like completely random out of a control. You just get it after the measurement. Uh, and your the quantum part and the, the first register that holds the pre-images of this u is still quantum. Right? It's a superposition of everything where you apply u, uh, apply, apply a and you will get u. So now this is your money state. Uh, so I take the, the pre-image register as the money state, and I take the measured outcome u uh, as your serial number that specifies the uniqueness of your money state. So, so this is, uh, we need to bear in mind that this, uh, this u is very important. Because uh, when, when we say faking a money state, we, we, we see that everything has to produce two states correspond to the same serial number. Okay, now, why do we think why at first glance people think this is a, a, a valid proposal? Uh, we first ignore what we should do with verification. We just say, okay, suppose the adversary can produce two money states, what would happen? Suppose the adversary could produce two money states, as we know, they are superpositions of vectors that apply A would map to U. So what if you just measure them? If you just measure them, measure the first state, you would get a vector, a short vector y1, which satisfies a y1 uh, equals u. And then you measure the second state, you would, uh, with overwhelming like, large probability, you get y2, which is a different vector that also satisfies a y2 equals u. And you just subtract them, you would get a vector that's the difference that is in the kernel of a. That helps you solve the short integer solution problem. So why? Because if the, yeah, the reduction you are just given a, and you just publish a, and then you can and you can prepare the state efficiently. Just as I said, you can prepare the state yourself and just measure the outputs. You don't have to know any secrets, any trapdoors. You can prepare it and give it to the adversary, and the adversary gives you back two states. You just measure these two states. You get two different short vectors in the uh, in the coset of of a corresponding to you. You subtract them. You get a vector in the um, uh, in the kernel of A, and that helps you solve things. So, uh, this question: So, is Q much larger than M? Uh, Q much larger? In what? In like normally, it's M. M is much larger than M, right? M is like uh, N log Q. N log Q or something. Yeah. Uh, so, so is Q much larger than this? Like, uh, you mean like a super polynomial? Modulus, something like that. Oh. No, not, not necessarily. Uh, but here's some polynomial that yeah. we even some exponential in N. Yeah, it doesn't have to there's be. A, there's a range of parameters you could choose from. So it could be like N to the 10 or N to the 5, or it could be some exponential as well. I mean, can, can you be like on the same order of the canal? Say that again. So, can, can Q be like, like for example, two elements, just something like this? Q and. Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, uh, sorry. Can, you mean like very large, like exponential? Like just, just, just like V or something. Is it V? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not, not sure. I, I think it is the same problem part like under small Q. I think I, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. Part, I so. But I think the worst reductions break down. They need modulus to be like alpha Q root n. Um, I guess n root n. Yeah, I mean, there's a regime uh, uh, to and sure the problem may be high, hard, but 
I'm not sure if it's in the reduction from worst in planet problems. Okay. Anyway, so the common case is to this one block is that way. Yeah. Yeah, normally it is. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think the problem is still hard, but I, yeah, I just, I'm not lattice expert, but I, I don't see people use like small cube, like really small things. Uh, yeah, so, but, but the question, uh, as I said, we don't, uh, we, I, I didn't talk about how to do verification. And uh, this is indeed where the, the, Bugs come in. So how do we do know that we're in a public key phase? So we have to do a public verification. So how do we do that to this month? Right. Suppose I just verify uh the harmonic state, the, the money state handed in by the adversary to check whether it's uh a short vector uh and that satisfies a y equals u. But adversary can do that even if it measures the state and just handing this short measure short vector, which is classical. Uh, we don't want that to happen. We want to take use of the quantum structure. Uh, so there is something we can do. It's called the quantum Fourier transform, uh, which in our case it's it's a bit magical. Uh, I would say so. Uh, so this is what uh, after you do a Fourier transform to this state uh, of uh, short uh, sh uh, of these short vectors in in the in the coset, uh, you would get to a state that I call. LW state, which is superposition over LW samples. And the arrows of these samples, they, 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 uh, they, they correspond, they are in a Gaussian, uh, they are from a Gaussian function that's, that somehow correspond to the original uh, Gaussian function when you sample your, your quantum money. And this is uh, like a seminal result by Regev. And the, okay, now we have a LW state. So, so I know the structure of a valid money state should look like this superposition over LWE samples. What, so, uh, what if I have a magic LWE distinguisher that can verify whether these are valid LWE samples? Suppose I can do that. Uh, I can first verify the computational, when the money state comes in, I can verify the computational basis, whether they are valid short vectors. And then I do a QFT. Uh, I ask our magic LWE distinguisher to verify whether they are valid. LWE samples. After that, I QFT back to our state. Okay, I say we are done. So suppose you satisfy both of these conditions, you should be at least with overwhelming probability a valid money state. However, the thing is, okay, how do I verify an LWE distinguisher? You you probably have to have a trapdoor to begin with to do this verification. But if I have a trapdoor, then uh, then the thesis is easy for me. Why do I have to do a reduction? And indeed, this is where the problem comes in. You actually can't have such a, a, a magic LW distinguisher. And in fact, if the adversary simply measures a quantum state and hands in that measured result, you wouldn't be even be able to tell this, uh, this measured state from the original state that's in superposition, just simply because of the, the security of LWE. If you're trusting LWE, then basically, if the adversary just hands you uh, a measure or say a collapsed Y, that's a classical string. There is no way you can distinguish it from the original superposition of Y. And this result was first shown in for super polynomial modulus Q in this uh, gen, uh, this paper by Liu and Chandri. So uh, and this is for uniformly random case that we, we have this property. And this property is also called collapsing. By collapsing, I mean if you if you are heading uh, the uh, heading a, a quantum register, which is supposed, uh, it, which is possibly the superposition of all pre images of a certain function value. The function value is given in a clear, or it's po probably a measured result of that pre image, a class pre image register. The adversary wouldn't be able to distinguish. And now it comes to the attack. So, as I have said, the adversary can simply measure the quantum state, it just gets some random y. And makes two points. And now I said, like, assuming that a security of LWE, no efficient verification will be able to distinguish this, this fake money state, which is basically a classical string from the real money state. And that's why our previous reduction doesn't go through. So if you recall, the previous reduction said, we, okay, we were uh, expecting adversary to give us two different Ys, but now it's not. It's simply giving us two same Ys. And uh, uh, the recent paper uh, by Kashin Lu and Shore, they want to okay twist this uh, this construction and make it work. 
So I said, uh, like the previous result, how a uh, help, uh, help for not a uh, uniformity. So what if we don't choose a uniformity? And is there some way we can make decisional LWEC? But as we mentioned, we only need decisional LWE for the verification. Uh, and uh, and we, we need Cs for the reduction. What if there are some cases that we can make this work? And so their proposal is uh, the high level idea is as follows. Um, so uh, they, they use a scheme that uh, very spiritually similar to January's uh, 2019 proposal, but with a twist. Uh, and this is our interpretation, our translation of their scheme. Their actual scheme looks kind of different, uh, but uh, inherently it's doing the following things. So when the A is sampled, uh, it's all, uh, there, there were like three short vectors that that's like sample first, and then we make sure that A is orthogonal to these vectors. We make sure that they, they are in the kernel of A. And uh, why do they think this works? Because they can use these short vectors to help you verify uh, whether the, these LWE samples uh, are valid when you do the quantum Fourier transform. And but we already give out short vectors. The, the why is short vector the short integer problem are I already give you a bunch of solutions. And they intuitively they want to rely on something called cases uh, that said, okay, I give you a, I give you a bunch of short vectors in A, but you have to find me another linearly independent short vector. So, uh, okay, the whole thing makes uh, seems, seems like a clever trick, but it's not clear in their scheme that once the adversary has produced two money states that pass the verification, we can certainly extract a short vector that's... Why three vectors? Why just not one short vector in the proposal? Yeah, I'm actually not sure why it's not just one. I mean, it can be could be like constant mean and but that wouldn't work either. Like, yeah, so. I guess you can me measure one collision and then add Gaussian superposition of these three and then it will- Exactly, work. that's the attack. I so see. I think what they wanted, the, the paper, their paper's attempt was uh, similar to like the thought, thought map you just had that, that they they think, okay, given Y is not secure because I can make a measure Y and I make a superposition out of this vector. But they somehow, Ignore the fact that given two or given like constant many, you can still do the same thing. Yeah, I think they they sort of sort of sorry sort of get got confused by the technical details in the procedures, and they, they think okay, seems like we, we just give us three it's secure. Okay, just as you should point it out, uh, the thing is we we probably can't extract this in linear independent R because the adversary can do something very similar to the previous attack. So the idea is that so even though we give out these short vectors that help us distinguish fake money state, uh, you with the verification procedure, they at the same time they help the adversary make make a fake money state that pass the verification as well. So basically, we said we can show that no efficient adversary can tell the real money state from a fake money state that's prepared by a partial measurement, uh, which takes use of these short vectors given given out and this. Can be obtained from a variant of LWE, but this variant is obtainable from standardized assumptions as well. Okay, and and so the attack intuition is I have a fake money state, which is a superposition of a measured Y after I obtain the money state, and I add like some these sort of linear combinations of this secret uh, short secret S which is not secret, which is because they are given in the public key and I make a superposition out of it. And these two distributions are indistinguishable by this variant of LWE. And the formalization is a bit more trickier. So, but the takeaway is, uh, a long way will show that the same type function is collapsing even for polynomial modulus. And we could generalize the attack on, on this scheme to, to rule out giving out any constant sort of vectors in the public key. And but but the, the most important thing is that the lattice based quantum money is public key quantum money is still largely open. This is just one approach. Uh, why do we think it's important is because people have been trying to twist it all the time to make it work and it looks hopeful, but it uh, turns out every time it turns out not. And but uh, but but what if you can find some weirdly distributed A where there's a separation of decisional and search shell W? You are probably uh, it's probably uh, applicable to, to build a quantum money scheme, and and of course if you can build post quantum secure I/O from lattice, 
Uh, I think there's proposals, but they are not standard assumptions. Uh, and if you can do that from relatively standard assumptions, you, you can claim lab freeze quantum money as well. So in general, it's quite open and we, uh, we can get into the second part of our process. So Jerry, uh, the, the, the attack that you described, uh, can you show an attack if the number of factors you took out is like four N, like linear in the dimension? Like let's say an n by ten or something. Yeah, actually, I'm not quite sure because I am not quite sure if we can prepare the money state efficiently in that case. Um, I haven't thought about it too deep, too deeply, but uh, yeah, why not? Sure. Uh, but I, I believe it's not it's not secure. Um, yeah, still, yeah, I, intuitively it's not intuitively. secure. But yeah, but, but like can... the whole thing is very sensitive to the parameters, and I'm just hoping that maybe there is some little wiggle room there. Mm, yeah, yeah, I think there there may be, but uh, yeah. Uh, I, I'm not quite quite sure about it. Mm. Yeah, it's just I, I I'm not so quite sure how to, mm, we we are not quite sure how to prepare the fake money state efficiently in that case. Mm -hmm. So so maybe there is some way around it to make okay. it work. Uh, sorry, it's a bit warm. Let me take yeah, a sip of water. Almost like uh, yeah, an added one. Uh, so sorry. I feel like it's leaving the feed instead of. Can you open this? Maybe uh, let's open the door. Uh, yeah. Yeah, let's, yeah. I feel like. Let's just open it. <laughs> this is not how usually it is. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it feels it, the weather is cooler like just yeah. a few days before. Yeah. Mm. That's the coldest thing. <laughs> oh, it's already getting better though. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, I think because the outside AC is working. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just like this room. Like it's just room yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, right, so so let's get into the, the second part. I believe it's more interesting. Hopefully, we can have time to get to all of them. Okay, as we say, a public fabrication is hard because what we were trying to do is that we were trying to hide some classical secret related to the money state that helps you verify the money state inside the public. So you are giving us some important auxiliary information about the quantum money, quantum money states. So that helps you verify. So what if the verification requires essentially no secret at all about the money state? Um, and uh, let me just get into this notion of quantum lightning, uh, which actually the first uh, two proposals uh, are quantum lightning proposals as well. Um, so in quantum lightning, we, uh, we have, so in quantum money scheme, let's recall, the, the bank generates a money state and a serial number. Uh, the adversary produces two uh, money states that, that, that will be both verified uh, corresponding to this serial number. And in quantum lightning, uh, it's different. It says that the adversary can generate a money state itself. So there is some procedure that gives a, C, a CRS or a public correct parameters that adversary uh, runs this gen algorithm on the CRS, and it would, uh, and it tries to produce two banknotes that correspond to the same serial number. Uh, that does can both get verified. Okay. Sorry. Uh, does the verification also take CRS? Uh, yes, yes, depends. Yeah, yeah, normally yes. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, like some not very accurate analog in the classical setting is. The first setting is more like a second pre-image resistance. I give you a specific money state, a specific serial number. You are trying to come up with another copy. And the second case is like collision resistance. You can just try to come up with any money state with the same serial number, but you should not be able to do so. And uh, you can tell this is actually a stronger primitive. So that's why the struggle of this, uh, like the, the whole uh, history is even with more struggles and uh, Actually, there's no, not much known about construction of this in short, from even relatively standard assumptions. Uh, like the best we have is from Oracle. And even worse, there are quantum oracles. Uh, let me explain what that are. Uh, so quantum oracle means that we have a black box or ideal classification of a quantum circuit, oh. which we don't know how to do. Uh, I don't think so. I, I don't These think are so. new results by James and- uh... Yeah, I think that's one. That's one, uh, one, yeah, probably the only paper, but their setting is restricted to this. Pseudo determinacy. Yeah, pseudo determinacy and also classical input output behavior, yeah. which is not, uh, which does not fit into our framework because our, our classic, our, our, our output, our input is quantum. So, 
Yes. Uh, yeah, I basically I think that's the only work that shows a black box of classification result. There is some IO result, but they are sort of limited as well. Uh, and the, the rest of the instantiations are, are from these uh, crazy assumptions we don't know uh, much about. And uh, at least quantum money has something from IO, which shows that it's slightly easier to do. And today I, I will talk about this quantum lightning proposal, uh, which we call framework, because we this is a very high level abstraction of properties we need for quantum lightning scheme. We call uh, walkable invariants. And uh, and if you and the, the the goal for future work is that if you can try to come up with uh, good assumptions uh, that fit into this framework, uh, which would give us quantum money. So our generic uh, construction uses something called an invariant. Uh, this invariant is a mapping between a set X and a set Y. Uh, so it has the following properties. Uh, for uh, this set is divided into many small subsets for the L with uh, the index, uh, the, the subspace showing that it's a, uh, it's a different subset. Um, and for each subset, there exists a Y, so therefore all the elements in, inside this subset, it's mapped to the same Y. Okay, after you apply this invariant function, uh, everything in the in one O is mapped to the same thing. Or So you can somehow consider this invariant as actually a function on O. So I tell you which subset you are in, you should give me a Y. Um, and uh, on the other hand, actually uh, different O's can also be mapped to the same Y, it depends, but uh, they don't have to. And you can see these O's, the subset as equivalence classes for all these in some setting. And uh, the other property we want is that there is some sort of operation where we can see permutation. Uh, it could be like a group of permutations where you can combine, compose them to act on the elements inside O. And it has this property that uh, you once you have a sequence of permutation sigmas, you apply it to an element inside uh, a subset O. Uh, I think, sorry, here I, I, I ignored a sigma. Here's a, here's a sigma before the xi. You add the sigma on xi, you get another element, uh, but it stays inside the subset. So basically, it's closed uh, under these operations. For anything, you apply a bunch of sigmas, you would stay in your, your subset. And also, these sigmas, you can invert them. And on the other hand, there is no sigmas that help you to get from one element to the uh in, in one subset to some other element in a different subset. And uh, the idea is that we, we can build upon money or upon lightning on it. Uh, the first step is okay, very similar to what we did in the lattice setting. Here we sample a uniform superposition over all the elements in X. So suppose the uh this is X that spans over all the n bit strings. So it's very this is a very easy procedure. Can sample it using quantum Fourier transform, and uh, the second uh, step is also quite familiar, uh, very uh, similar to the lattice case. You simply apply this i, this the invariant function on the first register, and you write the output in an additional register. You measure this register, then you collapse to everything that's natural one, right? So now I have uh, my first register. Uh, suppose it's like some superposition of all the orbits, uh, and all these orbits are mapped to, to this value one. Um, and what's the verification? The verification, of course, first step, uh, okay, uh, yeah, just yeah, just add a note. Uh, this y value will be used as the, the unique serial number for your money state that would come in with your verification. The verification takes in the money state, the serial number y, okay, first it computes coherently uh, on this pre-image pre register and check whether it's y. Uh, if it doesn't, it just gives their desktop. Yeah. And then you, you compute a projection that projects onto a uniform superposition for an orbit. Uh, and this orbit uh, must map to y. And why, uh, and I will explain why this, uh, is efficiently global. They, they, they has, that has to assume some properties of the sigmas. Uh, but in general, it's a projection is something you you are you know the description of the quantum state and 
you are project, uh, projecting a, a given quantum state onto it, and basically you are checking whether this is equivalent to this description of the projection. Uh, and if it is, it would give you a one, which means accept. If it is not, if it is not, it might destroy the state, but you are okay with it because you can invalid my state. And why, uh, as I said, why is the verification procedure uh, efficient? Because I mean, if I, I just create a description of, uh, I, I just try to enumerate through all descriptions of orbits that, that wouldn't be efficient, right? Our verification procedure takes use of these uh, these uh, operations or say permutation sigma. So suppose it's a uniform superposition of all the elements in the same subset. Imagine that you apply a sigma on it, it should stay the same, right? And Exactly, we use that property. We implement something, uh, implement uh, a unitary that, uh, that uh, which we take use of these sigma operations and we, we apply down the money state. And for a valid money state, after this unitary operation, we stay the same. And we can check whether we do true. We operate on the money state, we check if it is the same. And we do this for a few times, then we can rule out invalid money states. So, we, uh, we uh, and finally we would be able to accept sorry uh, accept a money a valid money state which would be this eigenstate of eigen value one corresponding to operation and for invalid money states they would be uh they would be like superpositions of eigen basis eigen basis that has uh eigen values bounded away from it so if we can satisfy such a property uh, uh such a property with our sigmas we are good. And after we do this uh, operation, after we do this permutation and check, permutation and check for a few times, we, are, we, we will be projecting uh, with all but negligible probability onto the desired money state, onto a valid money state. And uh, let's go into the security. So why do we think this whole scheme works? Uh, the first harness assumption we want to rely on is a very generic problem called pass binding problem. So given two elements, uh, x1, x2, um, in the set x, and I ask you to find a sequence of operations that allows you to permute from x and uh, going to x2. x1 uh, allows you from, to go from x1 to x2. So a, a very uh, easy classical analog is the discrete log problem. You're given two group elements here, and you are trying to find the the exponent that that allows you to go from the first to the second element, and of course that's that's pre quantum. So something called group action, uh, which is abstraction of some of the isogeny assumptions that haven't been broken, and uh, uh, it has this uh, uh, post quantum analog of discrete law called group action discrete law, which we could actually use in one of our instantiations. And actually, in general, you will see this is some. Some of a hard problem we can find, or at least we see similar faces like all the time. So it's not something crazy to assume. Uh, but the same uh, assumption is a bit crazier. Uh, so informally, we say uh, this is some a knowledge assumption for knowledge of past assumption. Say for a quantum unitary algorithm, an efficient quantum unitary algorithm that outputs two elements in the set on its own. Then we can have a efficient extractor E that extracts a path of, between these two elements from this adversary. So this is kind of a leap of faith. Uh, you know, their capsule analog, for example, is knowledge of ex exponent assumptions. If we have a reversible quantum algorithm opposite two group elements, then we must be able to extract the exponent. Uh, and it's, it's false in some settings, but it's, uh, I think it's secure in generic group model. And, but of course, you can tell it's a very strong assumption. And in the quantum setting, it's even stronger because quantum app extracting information from quantum adversary is hard. And we will assume it to be unitary because, in general, it's not true. Um, the, this is a leap of faith, as I said. Uh, but I would briefly mention that uh, if you assume this assumption, you can say uh, you can have a very simple property, which I call collision resistance over different subsets. Uh, it's just simply hard to find two elements in different subsets that map to the same value under the invariant function. Because assuming that the knowledge of pass assumption, you should be able to extract the pass between them. But that pass doesn't exist. So this, this event doesn't happen. 
And now it comes to the security group. Uh, this is the high level idea of it. Suppose the adversary produces two valid money states, uh, uh, dollar one, dollar two, and uh, they, they have the same serial number. And suppose they are overwhelmingly concentrated on the same orbit. Suppose, okay, the first state and the second state, they're just uniform superposition of elements on the same orbit. Uh, then we are in this case too. We can use a path extractor uh, to extract a path between uh, between two random elements that uh, uh, that comes out of the measurement of these two states. Uh, and in the other case, suppose there's like the non-negligible non-negligible weight on one of the states that's in a different different subset. Uh, then then we will be able to break this vision resistance over different subsets. And finally, it comes to our instantiations. I would say so. Firstly, as I briefly mentioned, our scheme is actually inspired by this uh, knots construction, uh, the paper for quantum money from knots, and uh, we our, our, our work is basically to formalize and abstract this construction. We're studying uh, what correct what property we need for the correctness, what property we need for what assumptions we need for the security, which wasn't shown in this paper. Because basically, what they said is that okay, we have some intuition why this works, but we don't do reduction, uh, okay. And uh, in fact, it's a, a bit more, it's actually quite tricky to make their scheme work. Uh, actually, we, we actually don't, don't know how to do that. And uh, anything that uh, ha can have like a provable security may actually advance not theory. So that's probably some work left for the mathematicians. And in their case, the, the elements of this, uh, are just uh, different knots. And there are the operations that move between equivalent knots uh, called random master rules. The thing is, we, we, we don't know if these random master rules satisfy the property uh, as we call mixing, which is basically seeing a random walk um, using these moves um, on the same subset on the equivalent uh, on the equivalence class of a node would uh, would mix in polynomial time. If you don't have that, our verification procedure is not efficient. And that's not proved in their paper and we really. And uh, I think that would probably require some uh, theory knowledge to advance. And also the hardness of class binding. I'm not sure if it's a solid conjecture, but I think it's a conjecture. Uh, yeah, I guess it's a conjecture in no theory, but uh, there's not much cryptanalysis on it. And uh, because it's too complicated. Yeah, yeah, I don't. I think that yeah, I mean the statement is not complicated. It's hard to find uh, the steps of moves between two nodes. Uh, but yeah, I, we don't know how to like uh, how reliable it is. And I will just briefly talk about one of our instantiations, which I, I believe is most uh, is easy to understand. Uh, there are two other instantiations. Uh, they are essentially the same. One is the abstraction of the other. Uh, I will talk about this instantiation from quote and quote functional encryption because it's not a standard functional encryption. Uh, so it's called something we call re-randomizable encryption. Uh, basically, how do we generate the money state? The generation is uh, we can just sample all the ciphertexts. We prepare uniform superposition over all the ciphertexts in the ciphertext space. And then we apply a functional decryption uh, algorithm that, uh, that decrypts corresponding to this functionality of, uh, for example, occasion-resistant hash function. And uh, you would get a result Y. And now imagine what would your pre image register be? It would be all the ciphertexts uh, uh, that correspond to plain text, which would map to Y under this function. Um, and what's your subset? Your subset is basically all the encryptions of the same, same plain text, right? Because uh, the, all the encryption, all the different encryptions of the same plain text. Uh, would decrypt to the would functionally decrypt to the same thing because because they they are they are the same thing like that's why they would compute to the same thing under the hash function. Um, and our procedure is we have to use a a, a re randomization a re randomizing oracle that helps you re randomize the ciphertext. Uh, for example, I I have a a ciphertext that encrypt M under random is R one. Uh, I put this in, into this randomization oracle. I put in another R2, and it gives me it gives me a ciphertext that's encrypted under uh, that, that's in, uh, that encrypts M under, for example, R1 plus R2, something like this. And uh, and the way do not know how to do this from even from I/O. It seems a bit tricky. The, the properties we need, but uh, but this is like something more concrete and intuitive 
thing to understand, uh, like the whole picture of this invariant framework. And uh, finally, there's the open problems. Uh, the first one is how do you verify? Uh, can you go back again? Oh, the ver verification, right? Verification. We, we at least as long as we have these uh, operations that permutes, like right, the permutes like one uh, element to the other, right? Then the, this operation of permutation in our case is the re randomization function that I specify. Uh, I give you an input ciphertext and I specify uh, another randomness R, which you can probably view as like the difference between difference of the randomness between two ciphertexts, and you would output a uh, re randomized ciphertext. Yeah. And, um, and uh, okay, so so finally, uh, the love, the open problems. Well, the first part is okay, we may be able to find some weirdly distributed A where we can, where the reduction can go through. And this is written in, in this quantum lighting paper uh, in Euro 2019 by Gentry. And, uh, you know, the previous caching in short was an attempt to fail, uh, but still open. And uh, and in the, for the second part, of course, as I said, our assumptions are kind of crazy, and uh, our constructions, uh, there are like uh, caveats here and there uh, in, our, in our instantiations. Uh, so what about like making them more reliable, uh, like instantiating, uh, instantiating the whole framework from more, uh, from more well-funded, uh, better-funded assumptions? And finally, uh, can we show the knowledge of class assumptions in some Oracle models? For example, there is this model called generic group action model uh, proposed by, by this written paper by, uh, I think, uh, also Hart and, and Mark uh, in Asia Print. Uh, I think it's the best paper, uh, best paper in Asia Print right here. Uh, and finally, maybe there's uh, like another way to get around this crazy assumption. Maybe we can show security uh, without such knowledge of assumptions. And uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of open problems in the area overall. Uh, that's it. Uh, any other questions? So for the second part, so uh, is it is there a case that the null theory and the FD are two different two different methods to generate the O and the C Yeah, yeah, exactly. So so. Uh, so I, as I have talked about, they are all fit. They all fit into our framework, which we call invariant money, yeah, or whatever. The name is not important. So the null theory is like uh, null theory uh, instantiation is like one possibility we can we can put into this framework if it satisfies these properties we want, right? So we want these properties of harness of class binding, and we also want uh, want the procedures that uh, that verify the non state to be a random walk uh, to the, like these um, permutations on, on the on the elements needs to be a random walk that meets in polynomial times. Um, and uh, if we uh, if we satisfy this uh, this problem uh, with the, the instantiations we plug in and uh, and uh, okay the, the knowledge of pass is kind of crazy but uh, okay if you can satisfy this you're done. Uh, but if not, I mean there is at least some hope. So for the null paper, yeah, it's one possibility. It's one one way to to make this possible, but uh, we do not know much about about it. And like even for the correctness, we're not sure. Uh, and for the harness, for the security part, uh, yeah, I think it's some big mess, uh, open mess problem, and uh, there's not much known about it in the cryptography community. And the functional encryption is is another way to do it. That we believe also have like some some of the properties they are satisfied, but some others we're not sure. At least not from standard, relatively standard assumptions. So so the reason why like you 